Thank you. Oh, hi. This is for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Yay. Uh, my name is Krista Wessel. I'm the chipper early morning host at All Classical Portland, which is <laughs> which is 89.9 on your radio, right? Everybody knows 89.9, a community-funded radio station. Oh, what a treasure to have such wonderful community support to have a 24-hour commercial-free radio station, community support for a symphony orchestra, for a ballet theater, for an opera company. We live in a great place, right? So thank you for being part of it. This charming young woman sing what seemed like very far from me, is a member of the cello section of the Oregon Symphony. Her name is Antoinette Gann. But everyone just calls me Tony for short. You can call her Tony. <laughs> um, how many of you come to these pre-concert chats somewhat regularly? Okay, so one of my favorite things to do when um, I get to do these is to interview a member of the orchestra rather than talk about the repertoire necessarily. You can read the program notes, find out more about the music. Um, I like to interview a member of the orchestra and find out their path to the orchestra, their history, what makes them tick, any deep, dark secrets. So, <laughs> Maybe so on the, the next, third night. The next 30 minutes we'll spend talking about Tony and um, her cello and what brought her to Oregon and what interested you in the cello and all. So first of all, tell us, Tony, how long you've been here with the symphony? Um, at the end of May, I would have been here for two years. So, for those who may not know this, that means you do not yet have... Tenure. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you talk about the tenure process a little bit? What does that mean? So, tenure for an orchestra is similar to that of when a professor gains tenureship in a university. Um, they can stay there until they retire, unless there are special circumstances where they've been particularly, particularly unprofessional and they've been given kind of warnings leading up to potentially being fired. So after I get tenure, <laughs> then I could stay here. <laughs> For the rest of your life. For the rest of my life. <laughs> Good. So the tenure review is underway with you because you're two year Mark is coming up shortly. Correct. So what does that require? I mean, do you have to like... Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> the first season, which was last season for me, um, you, we have what we call tenure week, where a probationary, which is what I am, probationary member of the orchestra has to sit in the first stand of their section with Carlos Calmar, our mu music director, conducting so that you're closer and he can assess how well you're adjusting to the orchestra, how flexible you are, how prepared you are. And then you have a, uh, your first probationary meeting after that for him to tell you what your colleagues have said about you, about how you've been in rehearsal, and also for him to give you advice on what you could do better. And so I had that last year and I did my tenure week, for those of you that were here, for the uh, what do we do? Um, Stravinsky, uh, Tchaikovsky, Romeo and Juliet, that program, so I had to do that. And my second probationary meeting will be at the beginning of March, and then tenure should be official at the end of the season. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> but from everything I hear, her colleagues love her, because you bring this um, light, this bright light to the stage. And I, and I, and I have to be honest, right, that's part of it, right? Like, how well do you fit in? Absolutely. Personally? Because, as anyone knows, there are a dime a dozen great, talented musicians that have been training for years. They can play anything, but just like in any other business situation, it's not just your abilities, it's how well you are at working in a team and what you bring to the table. So is this then... Uh, forgive me for assuming that you're incredibly youthful, but is this your first professional job? Yes, it I is. I hate to assume anything about anybody's age, but is this your first ever? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so where did, you, where did you come from? 
Um, I grew up and was born in Dallas, Texas, or Arlington, Texas. <laughs> this, was there a shout out for Arlington? Because uh, that's where I Texans, grew up too. And she also. That's they're crazy. From, they're from Dallas. Oh, you got they're, some ringers in the audience. They're my, okay. my cheer, <laughs> cheerleaders up there. So grow, you grew up in the Dallas area? Yes. And, um, what a hint of accent. Thank you. <laughs> I worked very hard. <laughs> And you know my famous story about y'all. We can get to that later. <laughs> you don't like the word y'all. I do not like the word y'all. I choose not to use it. I might as well just tell you. <laughs> um, when I was pursuing my master's degree in Houston at Rice University, I had a beloved string quartet, and all of the other three members were non-American. One was from Brazil, one was from Singapore, and one was a Canadian. And they all used the word y'all all the time. <laughs> and I was the only Texan in this, Tony, why don't, why don't you use the word y'all? I, I, I just don't like that word. <laughs> so we were having a rehearsal and I left to use the bathroom. And when I came back, my violist had written y'all all over my music. So I said, who wrote y'all? Ha, ah, you said y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> It's funny you have such a visceral reaction to it. I think it's kind of this warm, welcoming, but clearly. I, yeah, we, uh, Chris and I were talking about how it's kind of unfair, but any, even here, we're up in the north now, but anyone that has a Texan drawl, it's automatically assumed that they're uneducated, which is unfair, it's an assumption, but I guess that's partially why I have a problem with that word. <laughs> so... But right. so a lot of years in Texas, you grew up in right. Texas, went up. to school at Rice? Yes, for my master's. So between growing up and doing my master's, I went to Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore, Maryland, and I lived there for five years. Huh. Was there a shout out for Maryland too? I thought, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I like this. Um, so working way back, clearly music was a focus for you. Um, where did, I'm always interested, where in a young musician's life that switch gets flipped. You're like, oh, this is more than just a fun adolescent thing. This is gonna be my thing. Is there a story starting that? How did that happen? How did you find your drive to be a professional cellist? I've been asked this question a lot and I have a lot of trouble answering it because I'm not exactly sure <laughs> what happened. <laughs> um, I started with violin and piano at age five and then I started cello when I was seven and slowly dropped off uh, violin and piano until just cello was left. And I just, right around 12, 13, my mom said I just started practicing a lot. And she didn't push me to practice. I know there's this <laughs> stereotype about Asian parents, but, but she, she actually, she's always the one now to tell me to chill out. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> And my teacher at the time just said, right around 12 or 13, he felt like a fire lit under me because he told, I remember the lesson specifically, I was playing Haydn cello concerto in C major and I was working on the last movement, which was very difficult. And I was playing something and he said, Tony, every one of my students that go on to be professionals, they have a lesson where they play something better than I can play it and you just did. I don't think I can play that as well as you just did. And so it was right around then that it started to really become something. Just, there was no question about it. Wow, I just got chills describing that. What, like, what a humble moment for your teacher to admit that to. He's a very, very humble man. And you said you were what, about 12 or 13 when that happened? Yeah. Wow, <clears throat> impressive. Um, I don't want to assume any baseline level of knowledge, but this is a cello that Tony has brought out here. It's always funny, people come up to me and they say, now I can't tell the difference between an oboe and a clarinet, so I don't, you know, I, I don't want to assume any, would you mind telling us a little bit about the cello and your cello and where it comes from and maybe even regale us with a couple of scales or something so we can hear the tone? I, well, how do I, should I talk about parts of it or? Well, maybe the overview, um, I don't know. <laughs> what do you feel comfortable with? Does anybody want a cello, basic cello education or do you want to <laughs> move? 
Yes, yes. okay, good. A couple of yeses. So, this is a bow. <laughs> <laughs> and this is horse hair, horse hair on it. That is, that's what touches the string. Um, and these are strings which are made, they used to be made from animal gut, but those, because they were organic material, would fluctuate in pitch with the weather a lot, so they're not very dependable. Now we use metal, which these are metal. Um, How old is your cello? Right. Um, this cello was built in 1825 in London, so it'll be, George will be 200 years old in 2025. George? Yes, Did George. you name him George? Yes, it was really not that creative of a name because <laughs> the maker's first name is George. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a British maker? Yes. George? Panormo. Okay. Um, I don't even know what, the, what cellos are made of. What kind of wood, do you know? I'm actually not exactly sure what this one is made of, but... Yeah. And is there a benefit to having an older cello versus a more contemporary cello? Yes. Um, it's kind of... I would probably relate it to scotch. <laughs> All right. For any of you. <laughs> so when it's older, it's aged, and the flavor is more complex. So it's kind of the same with the sound. And scientifically, I've talked to some luthiers and makers about it, that they think it's because the wood kind of breaks down in its flexibility and and that's what kind of affects the sound and how it vibrates differently. So there's that. <laughs> well, now that you put it that way, would you play a little bit sure. for us? I want to hear whatever you're comfortable with. Sorry, I haven't played all afternoon. <laughs> no, it's beautiful. Um, I was noticing there's, what's, yes. what's this happening right here? Oh, right, so there's this shiny plastic on the top because it's a protective film because there's a lot of oils on my skin, which it would touch like that when I'm playing. Ah. So it's just to protect the varnish from wearing off. Gotcha. I almost looked, it almost looked like it was duct taped together or something. I know, it will come off okay. without <laughs> taking off the varnish, thankfully. I'm right. kind of curious, are you the only musician in your family? Oh, right. So, I think my dad will love this tomorrow. The music gene probably came from him. Um, he played drums in a rock band. Uh. And <laughs> he quit because he claims because he was meeting the wrong types of girls. <laughs> and then he met my mom, so maybe that's true. Um, <laughs> and then I have a older sister who is eight years older, and she's a violinist, and she freelances in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and she plays with the traveling circus as their flying violinist. She actually played here with the Oregon Symphony before I joined. Um, and she, she hangs in the, from the ceiling in a harness and plays Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. <laughs> She's very daring and she does it really well. It's amazing. Do you ever feel like you're an underachiever? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just, I'm having a hard time imagining such a thing. It's on YouTube. Is it really? <laughs> Can you Google her name? 
Or Ver- is it... Veronica Gann, flying violinist, and it will come up. Okay. <laughs> Watch all the, the, the <laughs> views on YouTube. <laughs> oh, my God. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, I don't know what made me make that detour to family, um, but I'm curious about more about your instrument, too, because right. I, I was interviewing Martha Long, our new principal flutist, in one of these pre-concert chats recently, and she told a very interesting story about coming to her flute. She was searching and searching and searching and searching, and the minute she had that flute in her hand, she knew it was it, right? And I was wondering if you had kind of like an aha moment and the angels sang. <laughs> um, I probably had this cello. I was trying it two weeks in, and even early on, I, I did have a real affinity for it because I had been searching for a year for my next instrument, so I had tried a lot of cellos. I lost count. And so I really had an idea of what qualities were possible and what I was looking for. So, um, yeah, there did come a point that this, the dealer wanted the cello back, but I just, I, I don't, <laughs> don't want to give the cello back. <laughs> but, and was it like that aha, uh-huh, or were you still not sure? Did you have to live with it for a while? Uh, it, I think as I've lived with it, I've come more and more to the conclusion that it really was the right cello, but it, it was really temperamental. And when it went to Houston, it was very tight um, because the sound post, okay, I have to go into sound post and bridge information. Yeah, I don't know but, what that is. I'm not a student. Right, but the sound post was really up against the bridge. So it, the sound post is inside the cello. Could you take my bow for me? Thank you so much. I know you handle bows all the time, right? <laughs> My boyfriend is a bow maker. Are you here, sweetie? I think he is. <laughs> so this light-colored wood thing on the top is the bridge. And there's a sound post underneath, oh, which... Maybe move it to the center of the aisle. So oh, that's in. a good idea. The sound post, I can't remember if it's on this side or that side but it connects the front and the back pieces of the wood, so it's kind of vertical like that. And I think it was just very close to the bridge, so I'm not sure if I'm completely right on this, and somebody watching this video will cringe because maybe my information is totally wrong, but I think the way I understand that it works is the strings resonate, the sound goes through the bridge, and then the sound post is supposed to kind of help the sound go from front to back. And I think the problem was, that, yeah, with the cello, the, the sound post was just so tight. And so you had it, the sound post move? Yeah, just slightly. And it's crazy, just the, a millimeter, you know, you'll, it'll barely move and it'll make the whole world change. So it's very sensitive. So when I had that adjusted, it really started to open up. And even when I moved here, I had to have it moved again because it was very tight and it sounded like it was choking so yeah so you got this cello in texas um actually the dealer that um had it and i believe he brought it to the u.s is in seattle and that was a long that was before i was gonna knew i would be in the pacific northwest so he sent it down to me in houston and so does the change in climate have a lot to do with how an instrument sounds yes and well it's possible that it might have been just the way that he preferred to have it set up, and maybe he premeditated what it might do in the weather. I'm not really sure, but it is kind of a preference thing, and so it could have sounded maybe just fine if somebody else was playing it. But for me, I just didn't like it at all. Gotcha. So, when you moved here, did, did it behave differently? It did. Um, the bridge was kind of moving, and. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Everything gets soggy. <laughs> it gets soggy. Like, it's slow to respond. and But, it, you know, the weather here is very stable, so I think George really likes it. It's, he's, he's happy. <laughs> <laughs> we want George to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've also heard a term, and I think when you and I chatted over coffee recently, you said this term that I've heard a lot of cellists use. I don't know what it means. Wolf? Oh, God. There's a, like a wolf sound? Yes. Um, I can demonstrate. I don't know if he's going to do it. But it kind of sounds like Chewbacca. 
a little bit, but like lower. And he has that little crack in it. So Is this a tendency for all cellos to wolf? A lot of them, yeah. It's something about where the, the, the way the wood vibrates and there's a certain pitch that it has trouble that the wood hits against itself. I'm not someone, again, this is very scientific and I know nothing. <laughs> I just play the thing. Um, <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, it's fine. You're going to answer fine. all my questions I've ever had about a cello. <laughs> <laughs> but, right, so I'll see if it, and it tends to be around E and F. It's worse on some days. Okay, well, thank you for answering that question for me. It's like these mystery terms about specific instruments. When I interviewed Marty Bear, our principal oboist, oh my oh, that's gosh, how you say the his things last I name. learned about reeds and... I didn't know that's how you say his last name. Yeah. Okay, cool. Good to know. Um, Tony just referenced the fact that this is being videotaped. All <laughs> of the musician interviews, I mean, I've talked to the principal bassoonist and oboist and any variety of instrumentalists in this orchestra. You can go to the All Classical Portland website to look those up if you like. Um, I want to ask you about one thing you do with the orchestra that is not on stage, and it's a new program that the symphony is engaged in with, what was it, Memory Care or something? What's this program called? And do you need a hand? Okay. Yes, just this week, um, I played at the Rose Schnitzer Manor in Southwest. Um, and we, I believe, got a grant for a program called Music Now uh, that works with earth tones, musical therapy, and um, this uh, grant for this program, Music Now, uh, is just, it was just the month of February involving me and three other musicians from the Oregon Symphony. And we put together an interactive musical workshop with patients suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, some of it involved movement to music, to tunes that they would know. So I played Beauty and the Beast and Yankee Doodle, and they pretended to ride a horse and march along, and then waltz to Beauty and the Beast. And then um, some songs that they would recognize for them to sing along to. I think I did Somewhere Over the Rainbow and The Way You Look Tonight and also conducting me. <laughs> so I played Ave Maria, and uh, Greta, the music therapist, would one at a time choose some of the residents from the Schnitzer Manor to conduct me. They had a baton. <clears throat> so just get this experience of kind of actually being in control, because some of them would be very tentative at first, so I just play, you know. But then they would get, oh, this is cool. Da, 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 da. <laughs> so it was, I, I hadn't done it before. And, you know, they're, they're elderly, and I don't know what's a good day and what's a bad day for them, but apparently they really enjoyed it. I could hear someone singing every time I would play humming to herself. <laughs> so I think she enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. It was really nice. All these ways that the Oregon Symphony is engaged with the community that we don't necessarily see. And I mean, yeah, <laughs> we wear many hats. Yeah. And uh, another one of those hats is coming up in April. I met you last year when you were involved in Classical Up Close, right. which is kind of like all these Oregon Symphony musicians on the loose playing free chamber concerts and blitz concerts all around the region. And you did at least one of those concerts. I did one, just one. Yeah. Um, so say a little bit more about Classical But Close. Are you involved this year? Do you know? I'm actually not. I feel like I'm trying to minimize how much I say yes to because it really <laughs> starts to get to be a lot and then making sure that I'm prepared for work until I get tenure. So... <laughs> um, <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> no, I promise I won't slack off after. <laughs> I, 
think those classical up close concerts are the last week of April. Yes, they are. But you can go to classicalupclose.com. Org. Oh shoot! I should know that because I'll be emceeing a few of those concerts too. And it's yes. really fun. It's, it's kind of it's, it's kind real. of like this too. Very casual, very informal, and talking to the musicians between movements of yes. a piece. Yeah. It's and they, uh, you get to see them work in groups that they've been rehearsing outside of work on music that they really love. They'll be playing for free in all different venues throughout the Portland, Vancouver area, and then we'll have these blitz concerts which will be, you know, at Powell's or Salt and Straw. They'll play little things to try to get you to come to the full-length one, which they're not more than an hour and a half, so if you have a short attention span, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, it's about time for us to wrap up, but I have one more question for you, Tony. Sure. What's your prediction um, tomorrow to win the Oscar for Best Picture? Oh, I think I predict that La La Land will win. <laughs> I saw it twice. <laughs> I cried the first and I bawled the second time. I did. I really did. Thing for musicals? It's just the story, I think, hits a little close to home because they're both artists trying to make a career and pursue their dreams. And, and it's sad that they felt like they had to give up possibly the love of their life for their dreams. And... I don't know, I just, I feel like right now, I mean, for musicians, it's kind of, there's always that conflict of your career or your dream and your personal life. Um, and I think th that movie summed it up and just kind of got to me. All right, I got my fingers crossed for your win. I like that movie too. Good. For those of you who came in a little bit later, this is a member of the Oregon Symphony's cello section. She's very kind to spend a half an hour with me today and tomorrow and Monday. Today's concert is videotaped on be on the All Classical Portland website. Would you please join me in thanking Tony Gann for her time? Thanks for having me.